Nitro is the glory. Welcome to the No Name RC Podcast with your host tonight, Keenan White, aka Lefty the Great. And if you are unlucky, the Finnish village idiot, JQ. This is the RC Podcast with no name, but plenty of content. So sit back, relax and get ready for some serious bench racing. Yes, indeed. Nitro is the glory, but e buggy pays the bills. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode. I think this is number one thirty-two of the No Name RC podcast. I'm actually recording this before we do our live this afternoon. We are here at the lovely Beach RC facility. Brent was we drove down this morning. We used the internet. We said, "Hey, I wanted to come here anyway. Why not come down here? Have the track in the background. We got young kids out there racing around and enjoying RC, discovering it for the first time. I'm having a blast on her. It's nice and." Breeze coming through her. So thank you to Beach RC for letting us come down her setup and do our crazy podcast. Uh, so shout out to all of the NNRC squad around the world. Without you guys, you couldn't do this. I know I kind of wasn't talking to people throughout the week. I was busy last week. I wanna we were super busy and it just we got caught up. So thank you to everybody that shared our posts and tuned in to our videos. Uh, we can't do any of this without you. Shout out to all the patrons of the NNRC. Obviously, you guys help make let us go there and do that. We can't do it without you guys, the extra support that you, you do. And while I'm here, I'd like to shout out to my good buddy, uh, and my, the person who drove me up there and who was helping me out and taking a lot of those videos on his iPhone. And that was Mike Hill, uh, the real Mike Hill. He, he, he helped out immensely. We was just two guys up there with a GoPro and a couple iPhones and some stuff. And, you know, we made it happen. And we didn't know what we was doing, but thanks to him and his hard work, he got a lot of videos, a lot of ideas. So thank you to Mike Hill and his wife, to Heather and his and his dogs that they love me so much for letting me stay at their house. So thank you to them. And um, yeah, so uh, before I go on any further, I also have to shout out to the sponsors of the podcast. So shout out to Mayako, of course, High Tech RC, Beach RC, we're right here in their facilities, TNR Fuels, Techno RC, Sun City RC Raceway, JQ Racing, Manscaped.com, Lugs RC, Papa Willie's R- Tr- Traction Tonic, Racecraft USA, Wally Builds, House of RC, RCGP. Man, thank you to all of our sponsors. They helped us go to the nationals as well. So remember, everybody, links for every one of those sponsors will be in the written description of this podcast, as well as our Patreon page. There's promo codes attached, especially to the Manscaped one and the Papa Willie's one. Showing the sponsor some love shows the podcast some love. So this is kind of just a short podcast because the raw president, Chuck Kleinhagen, reached out to me, the No Name RC podcast, to come on and tell their side of the story. So Joseph and I sat down, sat off, uh, sat off with them, uh, sat off with Chuck and talked to him, for, through, to him for an hour. So this is a separate podcast. It's just his interview with Mr. Kle- uh, Kleinhagen. Uh, it gives you some insight into what Raw is planning they wanted to get their their side of the story out and we had some questions for them and we asked them the hard questions of what they can do do things better as well so enjoy this part this short podcast and uh if you tuned into our live hopefully you enjoyed that as well remember nitro is the glory e buggy pays the bills and here's the raw president mr truck Feinhagen, with beaker and left one so we're just back from the raw nationals uh i got a message this week and i i was I was shocked to see it, but I'm glad they did. Uh, Mr. The president of Raw Racing of the Raw Federation of America, Mr. Chuck Kleinhagen. Kleinhagen, sorry, he reached out to us to come on the podcast because uh, they wanted a chance to to tell their side of the story. So we'd like to welcome Mr. Kleinhagen to the No Name RC podcast. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm fine. Lefty, how are you? I'm good. Uh, we just made the trip down here to Beach RC to get some good internet and uh, talk to you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for reaching out to us. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the Raw Nationals this past weekend. Uh, I had a good time uh, watching it and covering it. And yeah, I would say uh, I think the people want to find out what's going on on Raw's side of all of this. So yeah, why don't we just introduce you, like who you are and what, how long you've been involved with Raw so people have an idea. Okay. Let's see. I've been uh, uh, on the executive committee of Roar since 2000. 
14, I believe it is. I've been president of Aurora since through 19 and 20, and now into 21. Yeah. Um, I've been involved in RC. I got a late start in RC along with my uh, adult son. Um, so it's only about 20 years, 21 years uh, that we've been uh, active in RC. I own a uh, an RC uh, themed or RC focused uh, hobby shop uh, with four racing surfaces, and uh, it, it's in, in those 20 years, it's managed to take over kind of my life. So uh, good for RC. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to come on and, and uh, uh, not so much defend Roar as, as perhaps to explain a little from our perspective uh, mm -hmm. of what's going on. Uh, you, you asked off camera kind of why I, I reached out and uh, I, I've spent a lot of time on the phone and I've done a lot of uh, – uh, listened uh, or read a lot of text messages and emails, uh, obviously, uh, since the weekend. I uh, mm -hmm. was unable to be there uh, at the event, had planned to be, but uh, some family-related issues uh, forced me to stay closer to home. Um, but I w was in touch uh, throughout. Um, and and uh, in reading the comments on social media, uh, many questioned, I guess you could say, our competence. Uh, and I think it's fair, uh, you know, the question whether we do things right uh, and our competence. But but many got into, I'll say, questioning our integrity and mm -hmm. uh, raising questions about, uh, you know, I, uh, the, the manufacturers involved uh, didn't pay us enough or, or things like that. And, and um, I'd say my primary reason or motivation or, or that was those gave me motivation frankly, to, to come on and, and speak. Um, a lot of people don't understand uh, that uh, every member of the executive committee of ROAR is a volunteer. Uh, every company that's an affiliate member of ROAR pays the same membership. ROAR takes no sponsorship money. Uh, so we're not inclined uh, to favor one manufacturer. Anybody thinks we're favoring one manufacturer because of sponsorship. All sponsorship money at the national events go to the tracks. The tracks arrange the sponsorships themselves. Uh, the RMT is given a per diem for being there, and, and their travel expenses is paid because uh, otherwise I'm not sure we could get people to go out there and take the abuse uh, if they had to do it uh, and pay for it themselves. So, um, uh, like I said, I, it, it's fair if you want to question whether we're doing things right, basically question our competence. I, I think it's kind of unfair uh, when I start reading comments that, uh, that essentially call into question our integrity. Um, I can tell you that nobody at Roar on the executive committee and nobody at the on a race management team want to disqualify anybody. Uh, we, we get nothing. We get no benefit out of that disqualification. We, we get only grief when we, when our team goes out to do an event, uh, we, we, we hope that uh, the event is, is going to have good, fair competition and no drama and that everybody's going to have a good time and go home happy. Um, occasionally we achieve that and sometimes we have uh, events like this past one where uh, the drama unfortunately overshadows what I think was otherwise a pretty darn good event. Uh, the host track LCRC did a fantastic job um, and uh, it, it, it's um, it, it, it's the kind of thing where uh, as I said when I got phone calls on Sunday about the situation and, and um, none of us really wanted to do what we felt we needed to do under our rules. So, um, I guess that's an explanation of why I'm here <laughs> on, okay. on the podcast. That That's fine because I, I, I actually do agree by the rules. If you're over the tank limit, you, you are disqualified. This isn't the first time this has happened. This has happened at world championships. It's happened at, um, it happened at this race, uh, back in nine years ago to Adam Drake. So it's something that happens. I, I understand I wanted to come on her and defend the integrity, uh, but, but it's good because now it's, it's good that raw is coming out and wanted to talk to the people. Cause I think people just want to know what's going on. And this way you can inform them. I just want to, Joseph, are you here? Are you, can you hear us? Uh, I see your mic's muted. I'm not sure if you're listening or if you, yeah, if you're yeah. here. Okay. 
All right, so we we wanted to do you do you want to go in and talk about some? I have some topics that I want to talk about. I want to touch on briefly, or do yeah, you want to go I mean, in? Well, I, I mean, I I, I guess I, I would say that that uh, what I if we want to talk about the the specifics of the disqualification, yes, uh, I, I I can get into some of that from our perspective. I, I mean, okay. um, I I think the the after all the dust has settled. Uh, we're left with a theory proposed by a number of people, uh, in, including one or more of the contestants who were disqualified, that in pressurizing their terminology, the system, we're somehow um, we're creating the situation where, where they're over the limit. Um, I, I point out that the system is pressurized when it's out on the track. Mm-hmm. So, so when you read terminology like they pressurize the system, it, 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 you know it strikes some people as if uh, the system's not normally pressure under pressure. But of course, the system works with pressure from the exhaust system to push fuel into the carburetor. So, you know, now we're already at a level here where we're we're not arguing whether pressurization or a pressurized system is an issue or not, because it's already pressurized. Now now we're gonna have to split it to the fine points of how much pressure. And, and the pump that's being used is an aquarium aeration pump. It, it's not intended to inflate sports balls or tires or anything like that. It's a simple battery powered aeration pump from an aquarium, just enough pressure to move fuel. And the technique that Steve uses, Steve McLaughlin is, is the inspector. He's done world's events. He's done multiple uh, Roar Nationals uh, on-road and off-road. He uses the same technique in all of them. And, and as you can see, virtually all of the cars pass using that technique. And the, the technique in, involves, a at best, a fleeting moment of pressurization. I mean, he's using a foot pedal. So unless you're watching that foot pedal, you're not, you can't see, an, or unless you're watching fuel squirt out, you can't see that it's pressurized. And oh, by the way, when it's squirting out, there's not really much back pressure there that could cause that tank to expand. We're, we're comfortable that the technique that is being used isn't expanding fuel tanks. However, we're going to do some investigating. Uh, we're going to measure actual, nobody's ever, th- none of us have ever thought to measure the pressure of the aquarium pump because it seems insignificant, but we're going to measure the pressure of the aquarium pump. Uh, we'll take a look at some fuel tanks and, uh, and, and see what happens. But part of why we're comfortable that we're not doing it is the technique is, you know, he, he pulls the line off the carburetor and it, it's, uh, and, turns on the pump with his foot to squirt fuel out and then squeezes it to stop. His next stop is to open the, the lid. So the fuel has to, the pump has to be off when he's opening the, the, the tank lid. So, so the, the opportunity to pressurize the tank exists at best for the fleeting moment between him stopping the flow as he squirts it out to be sure that, that, that the line is full and him opening the tank, which is seconds at best, if he has failed to hit the switch on the pump quickly enough to avoid any pressure at all. Now, obviously, while the tank lid is open, the pressure line is generally attached to the tank lid, so it can't be pressurizing the tank while the tank lid is open. Then, then he, snap, he fills it up, snaps the lid back, and the next thing he does is, is connect it into the burette or the, the measuring uh, beaker and, and hit the pump to push it out. And you can see when he hits the pump that it, that it comes out. So, I mean, when, when I read some of the uh, comments, I felt it gave the impression that, you know, this thing is sitting there under pressure. It's a significant pressure and it's for some significant length of time. And, and that's just not the way the process happens. So you're, you're muted lefty. I can see your lips. <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to be a professional at this. Um, I I understand that theory. I've I've thought long and hard about this theory of it pressurizing the tank since 
since the since the race and our nine hour drive across and whatnot. So um, I'll, I'll leave my comments on that. But I kind of want to see what Joseph has to say about that. Joseph, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. So um, this is how the fuel tanks have always been checked. And it's been a problem in the past where in hot weather, fuel tanks expand and people fail because of it. And no one has really ever bothered to find out that how much the actual testing procedure could expand a tank or if it does so at all. The pressure from the manif or the pipe in the car, that's not very high pressure either. Yet right. while you are driving and the fuel tank is in the car and it gets hot, it expands. So we don't know if that pressure is helping to expand it either or if it's just the fact that it's the fuel tank's getting hot. So mm -hmm. that could be something to to investigate. But maybe another solution would be to reverse the way you test the tanks. Would there be a way of instead of putting pressure in the tank and pushing the fuel out to instead suck the fuel out? It's, it's um, it, it, it it's conceivable uh the, the as we sit here i can't uh i'm not uh not working through all of the steps mentally uh to do yeah. that i, I mean the uh, if we were only measuring fuel in the tank that would be kind of easy but because we're also measuring the fuel in the line to the carburetor mm -hmm. uh, we got to somehow make certain that line is full mm -hmm. and and um I, i'm i'm that that uh, off the top of my head uh, might be harder to do if we were sucking the, the fuel out of the tank. Uh, I, I read uh, an interview with, or I watched an interview with one of the competitors where he, he said, well, we, you know, we're going to do it the IFMAR way. Well, I, you know, Steve has done IFMAR worlds. So this, yeah, this, this had, is the IFMAR way. Yeah, this, this has at times been the IFMAR way. So, uh, so uh, uh, I, I don't think there's a, a major difference there, but uh, I do think uh, because of this, we're, we're going to take a look at at, uh, at what we're doing. And, and uh, while we think it is improbable that um, that's happening, um, we, we'll take a look and see if if we're wrong. Frankly, yeah. Uh, well, the the thing that I see is that. I know that some drivers, especially in America, because in America, most races, they don't tech. So what drivers do is they, they heat their fuel tanks with a fuel, uh, fuel gun, with a heat yep. gun, oh, and then they pressurize the tank with a air compressor. So they attach yep. the uh, fuel line to the air compressor and then to the tank and block the tank so the air can't escape. And they put some pressure in it and expand the tank. And you we, hold that pressure for a while and cool the tank down, you can actually add about four cc's to a normal fuel tank. And drivers actually do, do this, even, you know, that top level super drivers that are everyone's heroes, these guys do that, right? We, I'm not saying we, that they did it at this race, but I'm just saying that putting pressure, air pressure into a hot tank does expand it. We know that. Yeah, we and are also... In the past, we've had this problem at races where tanks have teched normally, and then after a long hot main, then suddenly they are too big. And this same topic has been discussed where it's a problem of the teching because for a moment there when you are pumping uh, air into the tank and the fuel starts coming out and you block that, but the pump mm. is still going, that's when you pressurize it and it could, in theory, expand in that moment and um in this race the reason why it's more interesting in this race i think is because correct me if i'm wrong but you teched first place first and then second and third and so on and mm -hmm. the f first place driver in each semi-final uh their tanks were too big and mayfield was second place so two first place and one second place driver whose fuel tanks would have been the hottest they had the issue and none of the other 24 drivers did so that's why this question becomes maybe more important in this moment well that that i guess you could say is 
what you would call a, a circumstantial evidence that suggests that that helps to support the theory. But I mean, uh, the we will I, I will say we are also going to take a look at I mean, because we allow a cool down period. Uh, we're going to take a look at the feasibility of just automatically applying and them cooled on period, uh, so that they're not checked immediately off the uh, off the track. Um, I do understand there was a third tank that was over slightly when first checked off the track, but then after the 10 minute allowance, which became more like 15 or 20 minutes in this case, because of everything that was going on, uh, tested okay. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, um, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, I, I understand that it being the first place drivers or first cars checked uh, helps to give rise to this theory. Um, but, but again, in your example, Joseph, where uh, they're doing it intentionally. They're they're using a, a, a an actual air compressor, applying pressure for some length of time, using a heat gun to get the tank uh, uh, good and hot. So so I mean that's those are different conditions than the technical inspection. Uh, yeah, are, of course, but well, it's the same well, idea. Yeah, I, I mean, know. We're, but 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 if if you know blow molding temperature. Temperature level, pressure level, and time are all factors in how the blow molding process works. So uh, if the pressure is sufficiently low, obviously the tank, uh, uh, the pressure from the car, which is not much, as you point out, uh, can't be avoided and uh, doesn't seem to be a problem. So like I say, the, the, the next question, and we're going to do some testing, is uh, the pressure from the aquarium aeration pump uh, to see how significant it actually is. Uh, yeah, I think. We know it's not there for any appreciable length of time, uh, but but we're going to, I mean, it, it's, it, it's actually uh, relatively easy um, uh, to do some control testing and, and uh, see if that's a factor. So we'll yeah, that would be interesting to know if it's a factor. Mm -hmm. And if it is at all, then maybe a solution would be to instead of pressurizing it to find a way of sucking the fuel out. Yeah. So you aren't expanding the tank. Is but it another question I had was, were these fuel tanks checked during the race earlier? Like was every driver's tank checked at some point during the event? I, I, well, I think so. Well, it's it's uh, the, the the inspections are typically done after a heat uh, of racing because we don't want to be in a situation where we're doing the inspection prior to them going out on the car and then have a competitor have some fuel system related problem while he's out there and claim that the inspection created the fuel system problem that he had while he was racing. So we tend to do fuel inspections after heats. We tend to do the top guys in the heat. Uh, so I can say with, with some confidence, everybody in the semifinals tank was checked at some point in the weekend prior to the semifinal. I just want to say, too, that uh, this was a big issue because fuel mileage was a challenge on this track. So I can't like we was behind the AE pits and they were constantly checking their fuel mileage. I, I watched them do it for a whole day. I watched many people going over there to get teched and see if they pass prior to the third the semifinals just throughout the week. Sorry. So this was uh, on a concern of people at this race. Yeah. And then All right. uh, I, I, we did, we, uh, the decision was made to check all the finalists prior to the final and then again afterwards uh, so that there was kind of a baseline uh, in spite of the risk that us doing the inspection could have somehow uh, messed things up. The other thing I, I, I want to point out is, although the cars were checked Saturday, and although I don't say this to imply anyone did anything intentional, mm -hmm. cars, mm -hmm. cars are not impounded. So okay. drivers could be doing maintenance. They, they could be doing whatever, um, you know, replace fuel line, a little extra fuel line, uh, clean out your tank, take the clunk out of the tank or the insert out of the tank, forget to put it back in. I, I mean, there's 
any number of variables. Of, of, of variables between the a check on Saturday uh, and, and a race on Sunday when the car has been uh, when, when something when the car has been someplace other than in an impound. So yes, yes, uh, that's understandable. Uh, I have a question about the number of tests, the number of times you can be tested and the actual cool down period, because I believe Ty's tank was checked three times. And I think some people were asking about the validity of that. I think it's supposed to be twice. It's supposed we were, <laughs> I, as I said, we get no benefit out of disqualifying anybody. Uh, so, so we were doing everything we could to give these guys uh, uh, their equipment, the chance to um, to recover to the point where it would have passed. Now, I, 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 you bring up a valid point, and, and we were aware when we were checking it multiple times that if it had passed on a third check, or let's say we did a fourth check, that there's likely to be somebody there in the pits who would then have complained mm, that, sure. we, that, that, that we gave him, that the, the book says two chances, and we gave him three or we gave him four. Okay, uh, that's I understand that. Yeah, but again, I, I mean, we, 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 all of us are race fans, uh, as mm -hmm. well as, as uh, uh, members of the organization and uh, or members of the executive committee. I mean, I mean we, we're well aware that the two winners of the semifinals, we were all, all of us, deprived of the opportunity. To see them race for the championship along with the TQ and, and everybody else that was in, in, in the semifinals uh, or that qualified, that transferred from the semifinals. So, um, I mean, as, as race fans, we don't want to end up in a situation where we got to sit these guys down. But um, you, well, were, you were there, Lefty. There were lots of people that saw yes, what yes, happened. Yes. That had we let those guys run, we, we would have had a string of complaints for of letting them run. So we were in kind of a no-win situation. To be fair, by the, uh, by the rules, you followed the rules on that point. The rule is that if you're over, you are disqualified. So, and, and, and according to the rules, you followed them. Uh, and I did appreciate that it was in front of everybody and everybody can see and, and there was no discrepancies there. I mean, you can literally see when it was over. Uh, my question would be to, is there some way we can, like, it's, it's a known fact that tanks expand, right? We know that they expand and they contract. Uh, there's a theory that maybe tr tanks, con they get to a point where they contract so much that they, they, I'm sorry, that they expand so much that they don't contract anymore. Shouldn't there should be some sort of leeway? Is there a way like, okay, if you test half a no. CC, like obviously, no, but it's got, well, maybe we raise the CC amount yeah, or something. No, let's move no, no, on no, 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 because no, no, this is no, becoming it, stupid. It, it's it's okay. 125 CCs. And there's a tolerance from zero to 125 cc's. Okay, so you just have to come and, on and, there. And, and and if if a racer, you know, you've got racers who have been through this mm -hmm. and understand that they want to leave themselves a little bit of a cushion. One of our better local racers and I were talking yesterday, and he said, if 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 I come to tech and I'm over 123 cc's, I'm going back and removing fuel line because mm -hmm. I'm going to make darn certain that I've got a margin for what's going to happen out there on the track in terms of it heating up. So you got that kind of racer. And then you've got racers who come up at 124 and mm -hmm. are going to go add fuel line because yeah. they want to be at 125. Well, they're, they're now not allowing for anything to happen with the car on the track or in tech or anywhere else. Um, so I, when, when you have a numerical limit, you know, mm -hmm. a, a black and white limit, you know, I, 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 our feeling is you got to stick with it. I mean, some people have said, well, there should be an allowance. Well, but if the allowance is one CC, mm -hmm. then those guys who want to be at the limit are going to plan to be at 126 and they're going to get yes, caught. It's just going to be, yeah. I just wanted to get that question out there because I heard, I heard that a lot. There should be leeway. And I'm like, mm, there shouldn't. I, go ahead, buddy. I think the only leeway should be that. In that measuring beaker, if it's right on the line, if it's like a questionable call, then you should always side with the driver. It's right on the line, you know? Yeah. That's the only leeway. When it's clearly over, okay, it's over. When it's yeah. on the line, when it, there's when there's an argument to be made, like it's touch, it's literally touching the line. It's a bit over in one point, but it's touching. Like what? Okay, side with the driver. Like that's fine. But 
no leeway that it can yeah, I agree be with over you. and be fine. And uh, I think we can all agree there. So yes. three of us at yeah. least. <laughs> uh, Joseph, any more fuel testing questions? Because I know the other big thing is truggy bodies, and I wanna I wanna ask him about that because that was the first bit of uh, skeptical. No, no, nothing really about the fuel. Okay. I mean, Thank I'm you. just happy that they actually disqualified them and didn't sort of bend the rules because they were big names. Yeah. But at the end of the day, that's rules. Rules are in place for everybody. We can go back to Sweden 2004 when Yannick Igon was pipped to win the world championship and he was half a CC over and that was it in the semi. So this has happened many times before. Okay. Um, all right, Chuck, let's talk about these truggy bodies, uh, the without them going over the shock towers. And then there was, I believe, HB try to like modify buggy bodies to put on there or and stuff like that. So there were not just HB, but many other cars as well. Yeah. Yep. Can you explain the rules so people can understand like how the truggy bodies were allowed? The, the rule is a terrible rule. Okay. I, I will state that from, from the beginning, but the rule has been there forever and, and, uh, and we haven't paid a lot of attention to it because it hasn't been an, an issue until uh, earlier this year when techno introduced their body. Now, the rule basically says it has to resemble a, a, a truck or SUV. Uh, and then the rule, but the rule then goes on further to say it cannot be a buggy body. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in the case of, of the, the fuel thing, we've got a black and white rule, 125 cc's, and we're kind of being criticized for enforcing a black and white rule. And then we've got a very judgmental rule. What's your judgment on what looks like a truck or an SUV? And and, and uh, there were being criticized because we weren't kind of like tough enough on applying our judgment uh, mm -hmm. to the situation in terms of what should happen. So uh, um, what what we ended up doing uh, is taking a position. If it was a buggy body, it wasn't allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, people have, have been arguing since uh, early this year that uh, particularly the techno body, which was the first one that was introduced, we didn't see the other bodies the body from J Concepts or uh, Proline till this weekend, the prototype bodies. Uh, but J Concepts body, or I'm sorry, the, the techno body, in between a shock towers really looks like a truck. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we actually made a conscious decision that although all of us, uh, uh, pretty much everyone on the executive committee uh, is a bit of a purist in some of this stuff. We all would have preferred to see the shock tower covered. The rule just doesn't require that. And so okay. the tech body looked like a truck and it had a nose cone that was rectangular and mm -hmm. wider than it was high. And it had, uh, which is the way most truck front ends are. And it had headlights and a grill at least in terms of, of uh, stickers that were provided. And so it met the letter of the rule, if not what we all would have preferred to see. Are you um, going to update the rule so the body has to cover the front are, shock tower? We are going to take a hard look at how to rewrite, rewrite that rule. Yes. I, 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 can't at this, I can't at this point say what the new rule will say, but I can tell you we're already exchanging comments uh, about uh, rewriting that rule. And, and then our normal policy in a situation like this would be to provide some time period before the rule takes effect. Uh, so uh, we're discussing that element as well. How long before the rule takes effect and what will the rule be? Uh, I have a question about that. Uh, years ago, didn't bodies, motors, all this type of stuff have to get raw approved before they were eligible for public sales uh for public you know for the public to buy a long time ago i understand all bodies went through an approval process currently there are the on-road bodies um still go through an approval process because there's a global body specification agreed to by uh the other members of ifmar uh, uh, along with roar um it, it's before my time uh, that they long before my time that they stopped doing body approvals for off-road bodies, um, and I and and I don't know why I can I I can guess that it just became uh, 
awfully difficult. Awfully, well, it's costly for the manufacturer and, mm-hmm. and difficult to, to, to write a rule that still gives the manufacturer some flexibility in terms of creating their own style and their own look uh, while uh, s- still placing, putting limits on there. I mean, we're, I don't think I'm speaking out of school, but IFMAR, the IFMAR block members are all currently participating in a joint exercise to rewrite the global body specifications for touring cars. Because even though we, we have rules and we have approvals, the, the bodies no longer look a whole lot like the sedans that they're supposed to. Right, uh, I agree with that. So, so, so uh, that kind of got away from us, even though when you look at them, uh, they, they, they seem pretty well detailed and defined. Um, but uh, I, I, I think there's a common experience for people on the rules side, which is there are a whole lot more people trying to figure out how to expand the limits of the rules and push those limits than there are on our side trying to define those things. So uh, the, 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 the innovators are almost always ahead of us uh, on the rule side. Uh, so we're all, we almost always catching up and, and uh, we'll be playing catch up on the truggy body rule. Okay. Joseph, do you have any, we have some more questions for you, Chuck. Uh, Joseph, do you want to go next on your questions? Yeah, so I'm not too bothered really about the fuel tank stuff or the body stuff. That's like small, small things, details. I'm sort of, I would like to ask some questions more big picture if we zoom out a bit. Okay. Can we, can we do that? Sure we can. Not what I signed on for, but we can. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because uh, I'm more interested in the future of raw raw and also RC racing as a hobby and sport as a whole because what's happened over the past decades is that the the companies and brands in RC have become more professional and they now employ professional drivers so the drivers at the top levels are completely fully professional racers and then there are also various staff members who have a full-time job in something that has to do with the racing so team managers for example and the whole industry has moved towards a more professional way of racing there are also now professional companies putting on events and race series so my question would be that how do you see roars and well maybe just roars future in this industry, do you think that RAW should become more professional also, instead of remaining, as you said in the beginning, as a volunteer organization? I, ideally, and, and um, this represents my thoughts and not necessarily official ROAR position, okay? But, but I, ideally, uh, uh, back up, my view is ROAR does Sort of, sort of has three sub businesses, if I can call it that. Uh, one is our our general membership side, which includes uh, with the, where the majority of those members are not professionals, and um, it's those racers who pay the bills, so there can be professionals. I mean, the the, the professionals that you mentioned in those companies don't exist because they exist primarily for marketing purposes to market to the body of members of, uh, of an organization like Roar who aren't professionals. That, that's, that's how they get paid, by selling lots of B6.3s uh, or uh, XB4s or what ha- what brand, whatever brand you like to uh, racers who are not professionals. So we've got a, a membership side that, 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 uh, uh, it includes those people along with clubs that are looking for insurance and, 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 and other things. And we have a rules and, and an approval section, if you will, or, or function, and we have an event section. And, and um, I, I'd like, they often, they, they're not necessarily in conflict, but, um, you know, uh, if we only think about the professionals, there's some questions as to what that's going to mean for the 
the amateurs. Um, uh, I'd like, uh, in an I ideal world, uh, I, I, it would be good for an organization like Roar to be structured with uh, a key individual uh, running each of those segments, if I can call it that, and ideally be compensated to run each of those segments uh, and, and be held accountable by the executive committee or board of, of governors, kind of like a company would be organized um, for doing a good job at running events or doing a great job on rules and approval. Uh, just like in any other company, uh, the, you know, those, those three segments require some coordination, but, um, but, but they, they each have their own um, kind of unique focus. Uh, and Roar's uh, financial situation, income that w that 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 has been generated, uh, if you uh, over the last four or five years, uh, including the COVID year when we had no racing and and uh, membership dropped significantly and no 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 race income, um, doesn't currently give us, uh, I, I guess you could say, the financial wherewithal to, to pay th three guys uh, and to be structured that way. But I, I think, I think Roar, the more we can look at that, look at what we do as those three business segments, as like business segments, and kind of focus on improving each of those business segments, uh, I think that the stronger Roar will be uh, going forward in the future. Uh, and the event side, obviously, the premier part of the event side are the nationals, um, where um, the focus is on that last race on, on, on Sunday, um, but also the opportunity for those guys to, to, to rub shoulders with um, uh, the, the non-professional racers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see Roar... I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna be president forever. Um, and, uh, you can never know in an organization where the members, where, where the people who are making the decisions are volunteers, uh, what the next group of volunteers is going to want. But I, I don't see Roar focusing on events only for professionals. Uh, Right now, how does the licensing work? You need the license to attend the Roar Nationals. You need a membership to attend the Roar Mas National. Yeah. Yeah, a membership. Okay. And there are no, you do not have any regional qualifying races or anything like that anymore? Um, uh, we have not for years. Um, what, what's it, the it, reason it, for that? It, it, well, uh, I don't know why they were dropped, although I can hazard a guess. But at some at some point we split into twelve regions plus Canada, and um, it, if you took the A main out of each of those regions, you'd have more entries, with the exception of of uh, perhaps uh, the event we just had. You'd end up with more entries than we have spaces for for for, for people. I, I mean, uh, given that we're you know we're trying to manage how many entries there are and how long each day takes and, and, and all of that. Uh, and you have a, a, a huge problem with differences in the size of the regions and, and the strength of the regions. Um, we, we hmm, yeah, okay, I'll give, a, give it away. We, well, the manufacturers know. We, we've been having discussions with a number of uh, the, the, the manufacturers uh, on the uh, fuel off-road side. Uh, about introducing some sort of qualifying uh, mm -hmm. events uh, and splitting the event into what what I'll call a championship segment, those who have qualified to compete for the championship, and a other. I, 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 you get hung up on terminology. I don't want to call it sportsman or, or, or whatever, but but a, a non championship. Like like a Euro uh, B, uh, yeah, something like that. A, a non-championship segment, so that uh, okay. and, uh, you know, in order to compete for the national uh, title, uh, you would have to have qualified to get a spot to compete for the national title. Uh, I actually think that's a good idea. We, we yeah, 
it, okay. it's, it's not, nothing's nothing set in stone yet, but right. but but we we we're, we're we're looking at introducing that. It, it's not it's relatively easy to do when you have two classes, buggy and truggy. Um, when you get into the situation where where we've pro proliferated classes for all sorts of reasons, and you got eight classes or nine classes running international, it gets a lot harder to, to, to do. Yes, but, yes, I would yeah. agree with that. The reason that I'm asking this is that I I want to see positive progress and growth in the industry. And I've realized that for sustainable growth, then you need some sort of foundation. You need a base. And a governing body, a federation is is that base. That's where it has to start. So Roa really would need to be the leaders in this. And I think that a problem is that if Roar isn't a professional organization, then it won't be able to handle the things that need to happen for this change to, to take place. So that's why I think it should be a priority to figure out a way to collaborate with current race organizers, manufacturers, events, and come up with a plan like this. So for just as an example, uh, if we think about this event that you just had, eight scale nitro off-road and nitro truck. You have your different regions and there are various different races that already exist in these regions. Would it be possible to, for example, make it so the pro class at certain events are part of a series, Roar series, and you get points in the pro class for each event and then your event the actual Raw Nationals is the final event of the season. This is just for the pro guys. So it's a point series and your Raw Nationals is the last event where if we are lucky, there's still a points battle for that overall win. I might add, I just did that virtually. Yeah. So then the other classes at the, these already existing events, those are for qualifying for the Nationals. So the non-professional guys are trying to get their entry ticket to the nationals in all these different regions. And then the people that do can then go to the nationals and compete at your sort of normal national event. Do you see what I mean? Well, I, uh, I, I, yeah, I see what you mean. And, and um, I, 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 what I, what I'll say is there are any number of possible ways that we could restructure uh, what it means to to win a national championship. Uh, I, I'm 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 uncertain in my own mind that any one of those is um, clear cut better than than others. Uh, we we've uh, you know what what I've said is. Uh, and about as far as I, th I think I am prepared to go in terms of, of discussing it is that we are taking a look at some way of reintroducing the need to qualify uh, to, to win a title. We, yeah. we don't I, I, we don't we don't think given. <laughs> well, I, I think we've I think I we, we've said this to to. Uh, I think we've said this to a couple of manufacturers, given that some manufacturers now I'm gonna I'm gonna back up and re, re We don't think that a manufacturer selecting somebody for a sponsorship should be the determination of whether they get to compete for the national title or not. Okay. At least I don't think so. I I, I, I think there there should still be a way for I'll call it a privateer, mm. uh, a motivated privateer uh, to get an opportunity uh, to run uh, for the national title. I like the Jared Tebow story. He didn't win a national title as a young kid, but he came awfully damn close. And in a system where we were, where only the uh, predefined pros were running for it, uh, that that might not have that, that probably wouldn't have happened. So, um, uh, well, I did a virtual series. It included DNC, PMB, Silver yeah. State, and then the finals at the nationals, right? And I just calculated. Most of these drivers would be here. Okay, some of them were not. But even Mayfield ended up winning it at the end 
he won the the cup yeah even though he missed one race so i think people want to watch follow and f- watch point series and stuff like that we've been it's been a long time coming in our industry and we don't have it even all these top guys are calling for a, a, a series to determine a national champion i also believe having regional races will get people in practice for these type of races. I felt that, in my, in my personal opinion, I felt that Raw was completely out of practice at this race. And guys were kind of <laughs> lost at first. And not only Raw, I, but the, the racer as well, because oh, racers uh, don't get to race this race as much as they, they should. That's why I believe we should have regionals so everybody gets practice at getting tech and, and doing the, la- the IFMAR style and, and whatnot like that. So I, at first, there was a lot of confusion there, but... Um, I just think if if this becomes sort of normal, yes, we kind of have classes and we know that's not going anywhere, but we have that one regional race where it's done, how it's done in the rest of the world, and everybody will have practice. You can take your qualifiers from there and whatnot. But that's a, that leads into a whole other question that I have for you in a minute. Um, Wait, let's but, stay on topic. I, we no, aren't no, done with this yet. No, so. no I, 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 I'm just going to say that I, I agree that both we and the racers were rusty. Hmm. We all had kind of a year off. Uh, whether we wanted it or, or 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 not, and I agree that the some that, that some sort of um, qualifying events is a good way to keep everybody in practice uh, yeah. uh, ahead of national. Th- I think that the reason that Raw needs to take the lead on this is that each manufacturer is very selfish. They look out for their own interest, and they aren't interested in helping the comp- competition. But Raw's whole point and reason for existing is to promote the hobby, grow the hobby. Uh, I think that a system where you would have a series of races that lead up to the to your Raw Nationals would encourage regional racing. Mm. It would encourage regional racing because all the guys in Florida or all the guys in Texas or West Coast guys, they would have to race locally at certain events to be able to go to the nationals. It's a road to that leads to the nationals. At the same time, you have a pro class where all the top guys go to these races because they want to win the professional side of the national series, which means that they would travel as a group to all of these regions for certain races. So wherever you live in America, you will have all the best American drivers attend at least one race a year there. So if you are little Johnny in Wyoming, you can drive to a race where all the best drivers in America will be racing. Do you see what I mean? Like this would reinvigorate and and, uh, encourage regional racing because it means something. And I think what Raw needs to do is you need to take a look at all the different race tracks and hobby shops and ra- uh, professional race organizers and work with the ones that are willing to work with you. When you make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. When you bow to someone, you show your ass to someone else, right? You can't please everyone. So find the people who have this vision of working together and growing the hobby and work with them and don't care about the others. Like, yeah, sure, welcome them. Don't, you know, banish them out of the industry or whatever, but if they don't want to work with you, so what? They can do their own thing, but I'm sure there are people and companies out there who would be willing to work towards this new national racing system of qualifying regionally and the professional uh, bracket of all the top guys traveling to all these regions and racing for the professional championship. And it would still mean that all these amateur racers who qualify for the event can go there and they can compete at this final nationals event. So I, I, I don't see there. how I don't see how this could be a negative thing. Like it would bring the industry together, which is good. It would encourage regional racing, which is good. Uh, a system would have to be figured out to where all of this um, brings more income to Raw so you can have fully paid professionals who are working on this in each class, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, then Raw's task really would be to be the governing body, set the rules, have people at the races making sure that everything's run correctly and uh, promote the hobby. 
promote locally. There's this event. Try and get people there to watch. Uh, provide media coverage. That's your job at that point. You're literally setting the rules and making sure our events are run uh, well, and you are promoting the events before the event, during and after. I mean, what do you think? I I understand. Uh, I understand your uh, I understand your points. Uh, and as I said, we're looking at uh, a variation. Uh, it won't be exactly the way you mentioned because of, frankly, it, it started closer to what you mentioned, but after discussion with the manufacturers, it's changed a little bit. Uh, but uh, we're, we are looking into um, trying to make the national title something other than a single event. Okay. I'm not for that. All right. Uh, also, the, I mean, if if it's not a single event, you will still be in that same situation where the same guys are still going to win. And uh, it's not going to be... It's like the series won't be meaningful for people who know they can't win. Do you see what I mean? I... I and introducing new more classes is not the way to do it either. I think the incentive that works best is having the professional class where they know they are in it to win it and they do all the stops in the season. And then the others are qualifying region. They don't have to spend money and travel. They can race locally in their region. They do well enough. They qualify for this final magnificent event. That should be, I think, the motivation for them to have a separation between professional and amateur. But at this final event, everyone races together. Mm -hmm. That's that will be special for these kids, right? And then They're the like, winner of that. To, I yeah. want to do well locally so that I can go to the nationals because there I can race against Mayfield and T you know it makes it no. special. Like I was invited, I did well locally, and now I can go to the nationals. And I that, think that winner, the winner like of that class. Rich, my dad's rich and I can travel to all these races and I'm, I'm a cool guy. That's not how it should be. It should be like, I'm, I worked hard. I raced locally. I did well. I got an invitation to the nationals. Boom. Now you're there. I agree. All right. Um, Chuck, I was actually at this race. Yes. And I, so I got to, I, you know, and I, I, I have been, you know, generally the general consensus is, and I, I have a, I happen to agree with this. This, let's be honest, this race and the ten scale nationals are your off-road guy too. This are these, these are the big money makers for raw because this is this they, these get the most entries. Both the ten scale and eight scale uh, nationals. We see the entry count on these on-road events. Even the enats is very low. We know that that doesn't make a lot of money for raw. Here it is. We have off-road racing is the biggest genre of RC in America. In fact, it's probably the biggest genre of RC in the world. I think the, the off-road scene in America is much bigger than anywhere else in the world. Raw has been lacking for many, many years. I, I know that it's a mix of people not wanting to join Raw and Raw fighting against other races, other people trying to be series and other big races and stuff. There's a lot more going on like that. But generally, the off-road people feel like they are left out. You have You had um, I assume he was Jeff Parker. He was there. I guess that's his name. Uh, he's the president of IFMAR. I'll be honest with you. I saw him on his phone more than anything else. Do a lot of it. Me? A lot of it with me. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. I'm sure. I was teased. I was. I thought. I'm saying he's probably talking to Afro or Javier or something. Um, but this is the general consent consensus. Consensus is that the people now are just to the point where. They don't want nothing to do with Raw. I'm actually trying to convince people to join Raw. I I look at the I look at the regional map. There's lots of regions that don't have representation. I feel that the offered side of of RC is really underrepresented in Raw. I think the onward guys are making all the decisions and and using the offered the money from offered to propel Raw and make sure that the onward events are great and whatnot. And, and all that, and the offer guys are just kind of left to fend for themselves. I mean, at this event, you had five guys, I think. Five, I think there should have been more events, more people, or maybe 
working with if we had regional uh more regional representation people could have worked and got volunteers for that i know everything can't be paid for <clears throat> by roar i think people the general people just want to see okay i'm going to pay 35 dollars. what do i get from Roar? i know you get insurance i think we, i encourage people to join Roar because i want to see things get better you guys have the infrastructure at one point i wanted to see another organization come up and i still feel like that sometimes i want people to join raw so we can fix raw we need to get i feel we need to get more forward thinking people into these positions in the regions so we can go forward i i i'll, I'll be honest with you i think that raw i think if and i think after all run by some guys who worry more about heritage in the past than they do about what's actually going on now we're still doing a lot of racing and stuff how we did back in the 80s we have to go forward we have to get people in there that think forwardly we can always remember how things started and respect that but we have to move forward not we look back but don't go back and right now we're not even going forward this is how people feel this is how the public feels right now and after this event the public like are really upset like these are the people that pay the memberships these are the people that go racing this is everything right now they're crying for either we need to have just an off-road section or we need a new organization i'm telling you what they're saying what i i hear you but one of one of one of the frustrations I've had since I got into the hobby as a racer, okay, or actually mm -hmm. I started out as a pit guy for my son who was a racer, uh, has been what I'll call the factionalism. I mean, this damn hobby is not big enough for the off-road guys to be fighting with the on-road guys to be fighting with the whatever guys, mm -hmm. okay? I, I mean, I, I, my own track, I have an indoor flat carpet track for on-road and oval, an indoor off-road dirt track, an outdoor off-road oval, or an outdoor off-road dirt track where we run nitro, and an outdoor dirt oval. And and it frustrates me no end that if I spend an hour on one of those tracks, I'm going to have somebody bitch that I didn't spend that hour on the other track. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the RC community isn't big enough to be fighting amongst ourselves. You, you're right. These are the two that the, the off-road events are the two biggest events of the year. You're also right that at the moment, the makeup of the executive committee includes more on-road racers than, than it has uh, at times in the past. But that becomes largely a function of who the hell steps up and volunteers to take these positions uh, when they become available. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we, we've been criticized that we don't have racers. So we, add people to the executive committee who are racers and then we get criticized that they're not the, the right racers mm -hmm. okay th th there is no shortage of, of attention on the part of the executive committee members to the off-road segment of the hobby uh, or the sport if you prefer to call it a sport um the th the fact that what we that the, some of the people in a segment don't like what we did doesn't mean that we didn't care about that segment. It, mm -hmm. it, it meant we had a different view of what should happen uh, in that, in that segment. Um, so I, I guess, you know, I, I feel like, what was it Rodney King who said, why can't we all just get along? Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, I that's uh, just how people feel. Famously. I, I mean, um, I run a track and my track stays open because of off-road the, the others well and during the summer because of, of dirt oval okay uh you know so so uh personally uh, although i suck at turning left and right and going up and down um uh, i recognize the value i i see the value every day in the off-road segment of our hobby compared to the other segments OK, mm. so I uh, it is not the off road segments not lost on me uh, or its needs are not lost on me at all. I mean, uh, one of the you got Garland Smith was part of the race management team this weekend. He's a regional director. Yes. He, he runs an off road track in Pennsylvania. I mean, mm. he understands that he's not a competitor, but that doesn't mean he doesn't understand the off road segment. Uh, you know, Joe Pillars. Uh, you know, has has uh, been in he, in the past team manager uh, for Tebow and others in the off road segment. He's on the executive committee. He certainly understands the the off road segment. So so 
I, I, I'd like people to not confuse or conflate things happening that they don't agree with, with us ignoring or not paying attention to the off-road segment. I mean, I mean, we know where, we know what the big races are. We, okay. Uh, we have, Jeff and I've had a quick debrief, uh, because uh, Monday travel was a fiasco for him, as it was for many other people with flights mm -hmm. rescheduled or canceled or, or whatever. Uh, we've had a brief uh, debrief a, a, and agreed that uh, we should have done, uh, aside from the uh, the issues we talked about, the disqualification and, and the bodies, that, um, that, that we should have done some things differently uh, at this event. Uh, in terms of personnel uh, and in terms of what the, we had the personnel doing. And, and you know, he started hit. Uh, uh, we, we end every event with kind of a, a list of what we think worked well and what we think needs to be improved. Okay. You know, so we're, we're, we're looking at that stuff. Um, so how would question. somebody, how would, one, one minute, Joseph. How would somebody that is, I know that next year we have the even number uh, raw represent, uh, re regions, like I believe it's where they decide who's going to be the representative there. I want people, I look on this map and I see many regions not, not, rep not have any representation. How would somebody who's interested in becoming a rep become one and how do they be how how would what, what is the process to do real quick so we, people real, that real, out there might be real, interested. Real quick, uh, Later this summer, we will post on our website and on our Facebook page that nominations for regional directors for, I think you're right, it's, no, this is an odd year, so it'll be Next odd. Year is the even odd year. Yeah, this this summer, we'll say odd-numbered odd region elections are open, nominations are open. It takes one person to nominate somebody mm -hmm. to be the regional director, and then there's a vote. Uh, following the close of nominations to elect the regional representatives. Okay. So I, 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 it can't be a whole lot simpler. Is there a uh, vote in the board or is there a vote? No, no, the vote members? in the region, a vote by the members okay. in the region. Okay. So they need to be a member and they need to put, okay, so I'm yeah. on the right path here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, Joseph, ask your question. I know we've been on here for an hour. Um, I have a live to do here in a minute, so we're going to wrap it up here soon because yeah, I need to get ready talking, for that. I can ask <laughs> <You're so rude. laughs> yeah anyway my question was Ephra has a very complicated way of making any kind of decisions and changes so let's say you would like to make a change you would okay you know what we really need to make a series or we need to bring back our regional qualifiers could you do it how would it happen what would need to happen for changes to be made <laughs> even simple ones like the truggy body the, uh, a majority vote of the executive committee, basically. And how often do you vote? It's, well, we meet we meet no less often than every month virtually. So you could potentially vote every month on yes. different things? Yes. And how are you able to become a part of the executive committee? The, the executive committee, there's a, a fixed number of positions. Uh, the, the way the bylaws are structured, if you're on the executive committee, you are on forever, with the exception of president and vice president, which are elected every second year in opposite years, alternating years. Once you're on the executive committee in an executive committee position, you are there effectively the way the bylaws are written for life, unless you resign or you are removed by a, a vote of no confidence by a majority of the other members of the executive committee. Okay, uh, how many members we do, are there? We now? do have we do have people leave, and uh, when people leave, we generally post that we we have an opening. We will shortly be posting that the secretary position is open. Uh, then we solicit people to send in what amounts to a resume. I mean, it doesn't have to be anywhere near as formal as you would use for uh, a job or professionally, but uh, let us know of your interests. Let us know of your background. And then the uh, members of the executive committee select from whoever um, whoever indicated interest. Uh, How many are you right now? 
Um, well, there's there's six plus one vacancy, and then uh, we have two. We have an electric section chairman and a fuel section chairman uh, who are non-voting members of the executive committee. Uh, there's one spot, like I say, that that uh, we'll be posting shortly to solicit uh, interest. Um, so, so it's you, Jeff Parker. You said Joe Pilas was on there. Mm -hmm. uh, forgive me if I, I, I miss something. We have a paid administrator who doesn't vote on the executive committee, but takes care of day-to-day -day business. Um, we have me as president, a guy named Tom Erickson, who runs an off-road series in, in Michigan uh, as our vice president. By the way, just getting in that he's an off-roader. Um, uh, Brent Klingforth uh, had been secretary, but we are moving him to promotions director. Uh, Jeff Parker is the comp director. Rob King is the technical director. Joe Pillars is the sanctioning director. Did I get to? I'm, 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 oh God, I'm missing somebody, and I'm gonna. Uh, I'm brain dead here. Um, bah, 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 bah. Who did I miss? I'm, I'm cheating. I think I missed somebody. Oh, the uh, the non-voting members, the uh, uh, the fuel section chair is Joaquin DeSoto, and the electric section chair is uh, <coughs> Eric Anderson. Uh, the, the, obviously, these guys are all uh, here in the U.S. Uh, and uh, but are all uh, guys that. Uh, that folks, uh, that folks would recognize. Oh, maybe I didn't miss anybody. I got. Okay. Yeah. So, do manufacturers and or even members can they send you proposals that that you then vote sure. on? Or yeah. How does we that get, work? We, we, we get emails all the time from people suggest making suggestions. So, Roar Roar can actually be a lot more efficient than EFRA. It sounds like. Well, we're. I mean, EFRA is kind of a federation of federations. And, yeah. And, and that that, that, oh, yeah. that creates a rather complicated. Uh, yeah. rather complicated structure for them to work through yeah well, well the thing just to like final comment i think that america has great potential to make a positive change in rc because america is the biggest single rich country in the world if you look at europe you can compare america to europe right Mm -hmm. You can't compare it to any single country in Europe, but in Europe we have different cultures, different languages, different countries. It's not the same. You have different states, but you're still all Americans. So you have a lot of people, a lot of racing, a lot of people interested in racing who aren't racing yet. There's a lot of potential for growth. And I think that someone needs to take that step forward. Someone needs to lead the way. And I, I don't see another way of doing it except having professional federations. So I, I really sincerely hope that you think about this and discuss this in a serious manner. Like it like it could actually happen, not as some pipe dream. Like actual step-by-step -step plan, like let's make this happen. That's well, my hope. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to I, I don't want to look like I'm making excuses or sound like I'm making excuses or whatever. But one of the things that we're looking at, the, the, the organization was structured legally uh, in the 90s as a uh, nonprofit social club. And the, the, the rules that govern nonprofit social clubs uh, occasionally get in the way of some of the things that we want to do. Um, like if it's a sanctioned event, it absolutely has to be all Roar members, which makes it difficult to sanction a, a big event like dirt, uh, one of the big commercial events, because there's no real incentive for the guy running a big commercial event to require everybody to be a Roar member. Uh, and, and some things like that, we are looking at, in addition to all the other things we're looking at, we're looking at the legal structure and, and looking to see uh, it, it if it's time for Roar to be structured different legally so that we have some more flexibility in some of these areas. So. Yeah, and I think also that everyone has to be a member. That's a good thing. And that's just a 
sort of something you have to negotiate and organize because sure. at the point where all the top drivers are going to these races, then I think even the professional race organizers want that. And when you have superior race coverage and promotion than others, then they will also want that, you know? So I think yeah. that there is a way of achieving a situation where big events want to be a part of what you're doing. That should be the goal. Yep. Okay. Well, Chuck, uh, we appreciate you coming on. Uh, I just have one more question before we go, and it's pretty simple. This was also a comment. What do, what do members get from being a Raw member, and why should, why should they become one? Well, you, you mentioned the insurance, and most people don't, um, don't understand the full value of that. If you are a Roar member at a Roar member track, uh, you are you're, you're covered with liability and accident insurance. Uh, it's secondary insurance, but we've had racers fall, uh, break an arm, and their regular insurance covered 80% of it. Roar's insurance yeah. covered the other 20%. Um, if you were to drive your car into somebody's forehead and get sued, You've got liability protection. Um, there's obviously the benefit of, uh, you know, the, the intangible of, of uh, as JQ says, you, you need a federation, you need somebody uh, organizing uh, the hobby so that uh, there's interchangeability of parts and there's other, other, other things, other rules set out. Uh, so you get the opportunity to kind of su support that. You obviously get the opportunity to compete in Roar events. Um, which you can't do if you're you're not a member, and, and one of the things that one of the resh one of the things that we're going to do as re that we hope to accomplish in reshuffling a couple of positions on the executive committee uh, is we're going to look at um, providing more tangible, I'll call it membership incentives. I, I mean, I use the example of uh, I'm a sports car club of a member, sports car club of America member. Uh, as well, and when I open my membership packet every year after I paid my dues, I get a, a wad of coupons that give me discounts on parts and stuff like that. That that that's something we should be able to offer our members as well, so that okay. in effect, in effect, they can look at it and so say, I got my thirty-five dollars back, uh, and then some. So. And it gives them a voice. They can vote in. Uh, yeah, people well, in their I mean, regions. you can vote in the regional directors. You get to vote in the national elections. I, I mean, uh, too few of our members take advantage of either of those opportunities. Okay. And one last question. Where will the nationals be next next year? Is there, Can you reveal that yet? or It hasn't been it decided. Okay. Awesome. We, we, uh, our process at the moment um, it is uh, a year-by-year -year thing. And uh, in August, we send out uh, a call for proposals uh, from tracks to host uh, nationals. Uh, and then when, if all goes well, timing-wise, in early October, we announce where the nationals will be. Sweet. All right, sir. Well, thank you for your time. You've answered all my questions uh, fully. I hope this answers some questions for others that, have, uh, that answer some of the other people's questions as well. Uh, Joseph, I think that's it for me. How about you? Yeah, thank you. It was a good chat. Yes, all. Thank you. Well, thank thanks. You, sir. Thanks for giving me the opportunity, guys. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. You as well. Thank you, sir. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, Joseph. Uh, we're going to wrap this up, and um, we're going to get ready for our live. Remember, guys, this is episode number 132 of the No Name RC podcast. I want to shout out and say thank you to all of our the NNRC squad around the world, all of the patrons that support this podcast, we can't do it. Without you, we're recording her at Beach RC. It's pretty awesome. We've got RC cars in the back. Remember, Nitro is the... Oh, sorry. And shout out to all of our awesome sponsors. Mayako, TNR Fuels, High Tech, Beach RC, Sun City RC Raceway, Techno RC, Manscaped.com, Lugs, JQ Racing, RCGP, Racecraft USA, JQ Threads, Wally Builds, House of RC, Papa Willie's Traction Tonic. Remember, in the written description of this podcast, you can find promo codes and links to all these awesome companies that support the podcast. Please show the podcast some love. Showing the sponsors some love shows the podcast some love. Joseph, it's time to go. You know what I'm going to say? Nitro is the glory. E-Buggy pays the bills. If you ain't grinding a slide, and Joseph, you have anything to say before we sign out here? He's muted. He isn't paying attention. I'm busy. <laughs> Thank you guys for tuning in. Talk to you later.
Thank you for listening to the No Name RC podcast. We greatly appreciate all the support and love from you, the listeners. Without all of you, none of this is possible. Special thanks to our patrons on Patreon. If you wish to support the podcast further, you can at patreon.com forward slash NNRC podcast. As a patron, you will receive early releases, special content and patron only giveaways also please follow us on facebook instagram and our website www.nnrcpodcast.com remember nitro is the glory but e-buggy pays the bills if you aren't having fun it doesn't make sense and if you ain't grinding you're sliding lefty out Nitro is the glory. Nitro is the glory. Nitro is the glory. so bad.